Good evening, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to our first event of the semester, Originalism 101. My name is Chloe Knox, and I'm the Vice President for Speakers for UVA's Federal Society Chapter. The Federal Society for Law and Public Policy Studies is a group of conservatives and libertarians interested in the current state of the legal order. It is founded on the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Tonight, we're joined by esteemed scholars Elon Worman and Lawrence Solem. Elon Worman is an associate professor at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University, where he teaches administrative and constitutional law. He is a graduate of Stanford Law School and he clerked for the Honorable Jerry Smith of the Fifth Circuit. Professor Worman is the author of the book, A Dead Against the Living, An Introduction to Originalism. His newest book, The Second Founding and Introduction to the 14th Amendment, will be coming out in just a few months. Lawrence Solem is an internationally recognized legal theorist who works in constitutional theory, procedure, and the philosophy of law. He is a graduate of Harvard Law School and a clerk for the Honorable William Norris of the Ninth Circuit. Professor Solem teaches civil procedure and constitutional law at UVA. His series of articles on constitutional originalism have shaped contemporary thinking about the great debate between originalism and constitutional theory. Professors, thank you both so much for joining us this evening. Um, how the format is going to work is that Professor Worman will speak first, followed by Professor Solem, and then we will have a Q&A portion at the end. Uh, audience members throughout the event can submit questions one of two ways. You can either use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and I'll read those questions out loud, or you can raise your hand and I will unmute you so you can ask your question out loud during that Q&A portion. And for now, Professor Worman, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Great, uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I assume everyone uh, can hear me okay. Well, I'm very uh, thrilled uh, to be here. Uh, if this were in person, uh, I would do a whole song and dance for about 25 minutes, and then I would have copies of my book to sell, but because this is Zoom, uh, I'm told I have only 15 minutes, which makes sense, uh, to make my initial defense of originalism. Uh, my remarks uh, uh, are still based on my book, uh, A Debt Against the Living, which I waved around earlier, uh, an introduction to originalism, uh, but now you'll really have to uh, buy the book to get the full picture, uh, so to speak. But all right, let's get started. Well, I think the best way uh, to defend originalism uh, is to ask, how do we ordinarily interpret law and other legal instruments in our legal system, like contracts or statutes or treaties? So ordinarily, we separate the question of what a contract or statute says from whether that contract is enforceable or that statute is binding. A contract in retrospect may be a bad contract, right? A law may be a bad law, uh, but an integral part of our legal system is that we are nevertheless bound even by the bad contracts that we've properly entered into. And we're bound even by the bad laws that Congress enacts. Why? Why is that? Why, uh, for example, are we bound even by Congress's bad laws? Well, because in our legal system, we recognize that so long as the laws are enacted pursuant to a particular process, a particular democratic process, that process is sufficient to confer legitimacy on the laws, right? Such that they are binding as a whole, all of them, right? Even, even those of them we don't like. So my question is, can't this framework apply to the Constitution too? After all, the Constitution is also a law, a law we the people enacted to govern our legal officials. So the originalist position then is that we first ask, what does the Constitution actually say? What does it do? What kind of legal regime does it create? And it may turn out, once we figure all that out, that we don't like all of the Constitution's provisions. Right? Maybe we think it's imperfect. Maybe we think we can do better. But is there an argument that we are nevertheless bound by the Constitution as a whole, despite any imperfections it may have, just like we're bound by the laws of Congress as a whole, even those of them we don't like. So for the originalist, I would say in short, there are two inquiries. First is how do we even figure out what this Constitution says, what it does? But once we figured that out, we still have to ask the second question, whether this Constitution is even binding, such that we should care what it says or does, especially if we don't like 
everything that it says or does? Well, the originalist answer to the first question, I think, is easy. We interpret all legal instruments in our legal system the same way we interpret any communication intended as a public instruction. Interpreting the Constitution, in other words, is in principle no different than interpreting a recipe for apple pie or fried chicken that you find in your great, 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 great grandmother's attic that happens to be dated from 1789 and written in Philadelphia. Think about it. If you found such a recipe, how would you interpret it? Well, you would use a public meaning, not a secret or esoteric or poetic meaning. Right? There are other documents, a Socratic dialogue or whatever, right, that you might interpret with some other method, but it's a public instruction. The recipe is an instruction. So it's a public meaning. Otherwise, it would be an ineffective instruction. It would be an ineffective recipe. And you'd use the original meaning, the meaning the creator intended to convey at the time it was written. And I think this is what Professor Solom has called the fixation thesis. And we may hear more, more about this. Uh, now, I should add, uh, none of that is to deny the existence of interpretive challenges as a result of indeterminacies like vagueness or ambiguity or breadth, right? So the recipe might say, if we're talking about fried chicken, add pepper to taste. Well, what do we do with that? Right? Whose taste? Will it vary from time to time, person to person? Who gets to judge? Right? So it certainly will be the case, I think, or I submit to you all, that faithful chefs faithfully trying to implement this recipe for fried chicken or apple pie or what have you will arrive at a range of plausible results in the world, a range of plausible outcomes, a range of actual fried chickens or apple pies. Right? A range, yes, but a circumscribed range. A chef couldn't just add rosemary to taste instead of pepper because, you know, today we all prefer rosemary. I mean, the chef could do that, but that wouldn't be interpreting the recipe. That would be amending the recipe. Well, I, I assume you see where this is going. Uh, a constitution, our constitution, the constitution, is also a public instruction. It's a public instruction from we the people to our legal officials. So we interpret the constitution with a public meaning not a secret or esoteric or poetic meaning. And we interpret it with its original meaning, the meaning we the people intended to convey at the time we wrote it and sought to bind our legal officials. But again, none of that's to deny the existence of interpretive difficulties, of interpretive challenges as a result of the same indeterminacies. So, and, and here's an important point, right? I think it will be the case that faithful interpreters of the Constitution will arrive at a range of plausible originalist answers to many constitutional questions. A range, yes, but a range is still a range, right? It, it still has endpoints. Okay, so that's the easy part. Are we all originalists now? Well, Justice Elena Kagan says we are, but the argument doesn't go far enough for those who claim that we aren't even bound by the framers' Constitution at all, because the Constitution is different from other laws. It's old, it's outdated, and maybe due to historical accident, it happens to be very hard to change. So maybe we want judges to update the meaning and content of the Constitution over time as a sort of second best amendment process. What is the argument then for why the Constitution is binding, like the laws of Congress are binding, such that we should care about its original meaning? Or as Professor Solon might ask, who says we're actually constrained by the text that we happen to have? Well, I claim, and I do so in much more detail uh, in my book, that the Constitution is binding if it is an improvement of the kind that Madison described in this letter to Jefferson that gives the title of my, of my book, if it's this improvement that forms a debt against the living. Well, what must the Constitution do to be this improvement and to create this debt? Well, I argue that the Constitution, to be legitimate and therefore binding, must accomplish one central task. The Constitution must successfully balance the two principal and competing objectives of a free society. It must, on the one hand, create a regime of self-government, whereby we the people can govern ourselves democratically, right, and decide who we want to be politically, socially, morally, culturally, economically, what have you. But on the other hand, the same constitution must also protect a large measure of natural liberty. Otherwise, why would we have gotten out of the state of nature into this thing called civil society, right? If it was this raw deal, we have to keep some of our natural liberty. 
Well, I should be clear by the way I've just framed this, these two objectives are often in tension with each other. We all know that often popular majorities infringe on the rights of minorities. So framing a constitution that successfully balances these competing objectives is no easy task. My claim is that the framers were remarkably successful for their time at creating a constitution that balanced these competing objectives through ingenious mechanisms of those, you know, of which those here on this Zoom call at UVA hardly need reminding, right? The separation of powers, checks and balances, the enumeration of powers, the Bill of Rights, the rec representative mechanism itself was a novelty, right? At the time, people forget that. But more than that, and, and, probably, and more importantly, I think, the framers wrote the Constitution in such a way that it would continue to strike a successful balance between self-government and liberty long into the future on both sides of the equation. On the liberty side of the equation, right, the rights protecting provisions are written in sufficiently broad terms to be applicable to new and changing circumstances. You know this, it's why the First Amendment applies to speech made on the internet. It's why the Fourth Amendment applies to GPS devices that police officers put on cars, right? Three things the founders couldn't possibly uh, have conceived of. Well, on the self-government side of the equation, what does the Constitution actually insulate from democratic politics? Very little. It insulates those rights most essential to free societies, free press, speech, religion, assembly, petition, self-preservation rights, if you will, in the Second Amendment, due process rights, lots and lots of due process rights. Other than that, the Constitution leaves most other things, most other questions to the democratic process precisely because the founders expected we would evolve and progress over time, right? I mean, if they didn't expect that, they would have baked more into the Constitution. That's so hard to change. And I guess it goes without saying, but I always say it, so I'll say it. Why make an exception today? For the most fundamental of regime changes, of course, they gave us the amendment process, which when you think about it, is exactly how the amendment process has been used. So therefore, so long as we the people today Okay, today, not as a matter of blind veneration to the past, but today, here and now, continue to believe, agree, and accept that the constitution of our founders, as has been properly amended, of course, continues to strike a successful balance between self-government and liberty, then that constitution, I argue at least, is an improvement of that kind that makes it legitimate and therefore binding whatever its imperfections. So I wanna restate this point one more time because it's the whole point. So I want to say it a little bit differently. There must be something that makes the Constitution legitimate and therefore binding, right? It can't be that no Constitution is ever binding. And that, we, we know that, that that can't work. That's not true in any society. Civil society will fall apart, all right? On the other hand, it can't possibly be that a Constitution is only binding if it says exactly what you personally would want it to say. 300 million Americans could have a different opinion about that. There must be a middle ground something that makes a constitution legitimate, even in the face of disagreement. And I claim that that middle ground is this threshold success in balancing self-government government and liberty, even if it's not the exact balance uh, you would strike. Now, if I'm right about this, right, if I'm right that the constitution remains this improvement that forms this debt against the living, and therefore we agree that it remains binding law, then I submit we interpret it the same way we interpret any other binding law or public instruction, legal instruction in our system. And that is with its original uh, public meeting. Okay, I was thinking of ending there, but because I have two more minutes, I do wanna say one other thing. I do wanna say one other thing because we're not quite out of the woods yet. I think we have to talk about the founders. Right? The founders also believed, by the way, and I think correctly that for the constitution to be worth more than the parchment on which it was written, it had first to receive the approbation of the people right, in an act of popular sovereignty, popular ratification, and it's this ground that the framers are most often and correctly criticized for, right? They're, they're criticized for being all white, all male, many of them were landowners, and just under half, about half, were slave owners, and that this uh, precludes us from being bound by their accomplishment in the Constitution, even as it's been corrected and amended uh, since. And there's no point in sugarcoating the founders, right? They were white, they were male, many were landowners, and many about half, as I said, were slave owners. But we don't celebrate the founders for any of those things because the founders didn't invent any of those things. The founders didn't invent slavery. Slavery, remember, had been universal up until the founders' time. 
The founders didn't invent the exclusion of women or the poor from the political process. Those two had been essentially universal. On the contrary, we celebrate the founders for overcoming these historical limitations in important ways. We celebrate them for writing, it sounds cliched and old hat today maybe, but for the first time they wrote in a foundational national document that all men are created equal as a result of which writing, by the way, people forget, half the states abolished slavery or set a time table for abolition between 1776 and 1789. Okay, that was in the words of the Princeton historian, Sean Valence, the greatest emancipation of its kind in world history. We celebrate them for giving us the first free government of the modern world, one that was at the time more inclusive than any that had come before. Remember the constitution has none of its own property requirements for holding federal office. It prohibits titles of nobility and hereditary privileges. And of course, the body of people who would deliberate and reflect on the Constitution and the ratification process was broader than anywhere else in the world at any other time in history up until that point. So we have, of course, progressed since the founders' time. And a good thing we have. But we've done so largely because we stand on the shoulders of their achievement. And I'll stop there and uh, wait for Professor Solem to agree with everything I've said. Well, Elon. Uh, makes a very eloquent case. And I, I urge all of you uh, to buy his book because it really is a very fine um, introduction to originalism. Uh, and uh, uh, unlike some uh, Federalist Society events uh, that are organized as a debate, we really do agree on almost everything that Elon said. So I'm going to just add some additional ideas and, um, uh, and, and then we'll open it for conversation. So um, I'm going to just tweak some of the things Elon said, use different labels to express some of the same ideas. So what do originalists believe? Number one, the fixation thesis. This is the idea that the meaning of the constitutional text is fixed at the time each provision is framed and ratified. Uh, so let me give some examples of that. Um, in Article 4 of the Constitution, the phrase domestic violence is used. Domestic violence in Article 4 referred to riots, insurrections, that is violence of a political kind within a state not spousal abuse, child abuse, um, uh, or other violence within a family, which is the modern meaning. We want to know what the Constitution means. We look to the meaning as it was fixed at the time the Constitution was adopted. Second example, Seventh Amendment to the United States Constitution uses the term dollar. And we all think we know what they meant by the term dollar, because we've got dollars, $20, you probably, good chance you have a $20 bill uh, in your wallet. Um, but that's not what the term dollar meant in 1791. The term dollar in 1791 could not have referred to the modern dollar, it didn't exist and there were no federal dollars in 1791. Uh, what were there? There were these. This is the Spanish silver dollar, the most li widely used unit of currency in the United States in 1791. They had a different conception of money than we have. Their understanding was a hard currency understanding. And so when they said the value of $20, they meant the value of the amount of silver contained in 20 Spanish silver dollars. And when they did finally create the US dollar, the first ones came out in 1793, uh, they uh, matched uh, the silver content of the Spanish silver dollar. Except they cheated just a little bit. That's an interesting constitutional question. It's another example. The Constitution uses what we now think of as the masculine pronoun he uh, to refer to various constitutional officers, including the President of the United States. 
So does that mean that the president can only be a man? No, because the original meaning of he, the meaning that the uh, pronoun he had in uh, 1791 is closer to modern uses of they as a gender neutral pronoun. He could mean the masculine, but it also was used as a gender neutral construction. If we want to know what he meant, we don't look to 2020 uses of the pronoun he. We look to 1787 linguistic practices, the fixation thesis. Second idea, the constraint principle. Elon's been remarkably clear about this, so I have very little to say. The idea of the constraint principle is that the meaning of the constitutional text, the content of the constitutional text is binding. We're not free to ignore it. We're bound by it. Judges may not act in a way that's inconsistent with that. Third idea. Again, Elon's been remarkably clear. The public meaning thesis. The public meaning thesis addresses the question, what is that meaning? What is original meaning? And most originalists, not all, but most, adopt the position that the relevant meaning is public meaning. The content that the constitutional text communicated to the public in 1787 for the original constitution, 1791 for the first 10 amendments, and so on. Uh, the relevant public changes over time. Linguistic practices change over time. So it's the public at the time each provision is framed and ratified. I want to um, elaborate on an idea that Elon introduced, and I want to change the terminology. Elon talked about indeterminacy. I think that's not a good word. Indeterminacy implies that everything's up for grabs. Determinacy implies that everything is fixed. And if we think of things that way, there's only two alternatives. Either everything is up for grabs, in which case we're doomed to living constitutionalism, or everything is determined. Everything has a invariable, clear, bright line meaning. The better concept is under determinacy. The constitutional text under determines some questions. On other questions, the text is quite clear. The president must be 35 years of age. Well, there are some micro ambiguities. Uh, there might be rounding questions about someone who's born very close to midnight or whose birthday is very close to the relevant time uh, that the president would assume office. But uh, uh, none of those micro ambiguities have ever made a difference. And that provision is almost fully determined. Other provisions, freedom of speech, perhaps, um, uh, legislative power, perhaps, uh, executive power, judicial power, um, have a core of determinate meaning. But there are cases that fall into what the philosopher H.L.A. Hart called the penumbra, the zone of uncertainty. And in those cases, originalists are going to have to have an account, a theory of what we ought to do. That raises what is sometimes called the interpretation, construction, distinction. So frequently those two words, interpretation and construction, are used as synonyms. Many contemporary originalists use them in a very old sense, goes back all the way to 1839 at least, uh, in which we're referring to two different activities. Interpretation, this is what Elon calls figuring out the meaning of the text. What does the text say? What does it communicate? Construction, that's determining what legal effect the text will have. Originalists say that when interpretation yields a clear result, then construction must follow. But when interpretation yields an underdeterminacy, a provision that's open textually or vague, then we have a construction zone. 
You're going to have to do something with those cases. If you're an originalist, Professor Barnett, my colleague at Georgetown University, suggests that in those cases where the letter is underdeterminate, we follow the spirit. That is, we seek the function of the constitutional provision, the original function, the purpose for which the provision was uh, designed. I want to make another point. This is about original expected applications and their role for originalists. So not only is there the meaning of the constitutional text, but there are lots of beliefs that the framers had, the public had, um, about the anti-federalists, the opponents of the constitution had about how the constitution would be put into effect. Public meaning originalists believe that those expectations, those beliefs about what legal effect the Constitution would have, are evidence of meaning, good evidence, powerful evidence. But that evidence is not itself the meaning of the constitutional text. So beliefs about the framers, about particular issues, those are important, we take them into account, but we are not bound by them. I wanna say a word about the rival of originalism, living constitutionalism. So you can't just say, I'm an originalist because originalism is good, because that's not a complete argument. In order to make the case for originalism, we have to consider the alternatives. Same thing applies to people who oppose originalism. If you're against originalism, that's not enough. You have to have a position of your own. Now, we have sort of an umbrella term, living constitutionalism, that we use to refer to all kinds of forms of non-originalism. For instance, very recently, my very good friend, Adrian Vermeule, has written an article where he has argued that conservatives should reject originalism because originalism does not get you everything you want if you're a conservative. If you're a conservative, sometimes the original meaning of the constitutional text leads to outcomes that you may not like, and it certainly doesn't guarantee you everything you want. And so Adrian Vermeule has argued for a form of living constitutionalism rooted in the legal theory of Ronald Dworkin, but with a twist that conservative values should animate the living constitution. That's one form of living constitutionalism, the Dworkinian form. Of course, for every Adrian Vermeule, there are like 50 progressive Dworkinians who have a very different vision of what values the Constitution uh, embodies. Sometimes Dworkin's approach is called the moral readings approach. And of course, different um, constitutional scholars and judges have different ideas about what the constitutional values are. A second version of living constitutionalism, common law constitutionalism, David Strauss. So Professor Strauss from the University of Chicago says that constitutional law has very little to do with the constitutional text. Constitutional text, that's fine. We could take a glance, look at it, might be relevant, might give us some good ideas. But the content of constitutional law should be defined by judges using a common law process. Another popular theory is called constitutional pluralism or the multiple modalities approach. This is the idea that judges use many different approaches in constitutional cases. They look at the text, they look at original meaning, but they also look at other history, later history. They look at precedent. They look at constitutional values. They look at pragmatic factors. They look at constitutional structure. Different pluralists have different lists. Some have five, some have six, some have seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and more. 
So this approach says there's no one method. There's a plurality of methods and there's no master principle. There's no hierarchy among the plurality of methods of constitutional art. One more approach, one more enemy of originalism, Thayerianism. So James Bradley Thayer, Thayer, famous constitutional theorist, wrote at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, the originator of the idea that courts should defer to elected officials. So Thayerianism is another rival of originalism. Now, I want to make a big, important point. You can't compare generic originalism to generic living constitutionalism because living constitutionalism involves many different and opposed positions. The differences between a Thayerian approach that says the court should get out of the constitution enforcing business and let Congress do what it wants to do and common law constitutionalism the court should rule the roost. They should actually define uh, what the Constitution means. The difference between those two positions is greater than the difference of either one of those positions from originalism. So we need to do pairwise comparison. If you're against originalism, you have to have an alternative and compare that alternative to originalism. If you're for originalism, you have to pick a particular form and then show that that form of originalism is better one by one with each of the significant rivals. Okay, I'm done. Well, great. We've got quite a few questions, so we're going to try and get through them. I'm glad we left plenty of time for that. Um, and as a reminder, if you do have questions, you can either use that Q&A function at the bottom or you can raise your hand and I will unmute you so you can ask your question. So I'll go ahead and get started because we have quite a few. Um, the first question says, surely there are state constitutions that preceded the Constitution and had clues about originalism, correct? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, and then the big question, though, is what do we do with that clue? Because does the federal constitution reject a lot of what the state constitution uh, do, state constitutions did? Does it adopt, adopt what they did? So you kind of have to look at the context and, and, and see whether they were sort of adopted wholesale or whether they were rejected in some way. Uh, but, but yes, but, but the closest analog is the New York constitution, which is to the federal constitution. And it's, it's, it's uncannily close, you know, like read, read the executive power provisions. It, it reads almost like Article 2. Uh, and so surely even looking to the practices of the New York governor can, can help in that, in that respect. But, I have two things to add. Number one, there's been some empirical work done on the actual methods used by state Supreme Courts to interpret state constitutions. I can't vouch for the accuracy of the work because I haven't read the underlying data. But the published studies suggest that originalism is the predominant mode of interpretation for state constitutions. The second thing is some very innovative originalist work is being done by state Supreme Courts. And I would just cite one example, Justice Thomas Lee on the Utah Supreme Court, um, who has been a pioneer in sophisticated originalist approaches generally. He has a lot to teach the judges on the federal bench, including justices of the Supreme Court, and in particular, the use of big data approaches to determining original meaning via the methods of what's called corpus linguistics, big data analysis of original meaning. Don't be afraid to raise your hand and turn your video camera mm -hmm. on and make this as close to in-person as possible. We won't mind. Professor Warman's a big fan of uh, hearing questions out loud, for sure. Our second question that someone typed in is, has Justice Kavanaugh's time on the Supreme Court given any insight to how he feels about originalism? If he supports it, is he more along the lines of Justice Scalia or on the Justice Thomas line or a line of his own? I, I would say a line of his own. 
uh, we have two sets of clues about Kavanaugh. One is his testimony in his confirmation hearings where he very clearly stated that he was an originalist, a public meaning originalist. Um, so there's uh, his testimony about his methodological orientation. Uh, in his opinions, he has given considerable weight to precedent. And I would say that early Kavanaugh gives more weight to precedent than late Scalia. And that he clearly gives much more weight to precedent than does Justice Thomas. I don't think I have anything uh, to, to add to that. And, but, but one thing I will say is I don't see a sharp distinction between textualism and originalism. Uh, often, you know, te textualism is said to apply to statutory interpretation, originalism to the Constitution. It's the same method, different documents. Uh, I think no one has been able to convince me otherwise. Some, you know, Professor Solomon agrees, great. Yeah. Uh, some, you know, say, um, well, textualism is just looking at the words uh, and originalism is looking at, you know, intent and history. And that confuses me. I don't understand that distinction. I don't think textual, most textualists understand themselves that way because text only has meaning in context. It only has meaning against a historical background. You know, texts were enacted to affect certain changes in the world for certain purposes and understanding all of those things helps us understand what the textual meaning is. And then I'll just say that if we go to Textualism, originalism, as applied to statutes, right? The recent Bostock case reflects that you can have reasonable disagreements over uh, the results. I, I, again, the, the, I think it's a mistake to say the virtue of originalism is that it leads to one right answer. I don't think originalists have ever claimed that, even though the opponents love to claim that we've claimed it and then to show how it's not true. Uh, I think it's much more constraining. The range of answers is much more circumscribed than the alternatives, but that doesn't mean you aren't going to get a range uh, of plausible answers, but the Kavanaugh-Gorsuch split is, is a nice example of, of how it can plausibly lead to different answers there in the statutory interpretation context of, of Title VII. And I'll leave it at that. Okay, our next question is from Camilo Garcia. He says, what grounds the Constitution's normativity for racial minorities that were both, one, excluded from ratification and self-government, and two, were and continue to be unable to secure protection of their rights or even their life from the state? So that's a great question, and we sort of have to break that up into both parts. Um, you'll notice that I left my defense of the founding to sort of an afterthought. I mean, it's, it's, it's not an afterthought, but note that my claim wasn't that, well, if the founders were great back then, then we must be bound by them. My claim was if today, we the people continue to agree that we're gonna have reasonable disagreements over the content of a constitution, but that our constitution, as it has been amended, you know, uh, continues to strike the successful balance between self-government and liberty, then if we the people today recognize the constitution as legitimate and binding, who's to tell us it's not, right? This is sort of a hard and rule of recognition problem. Um, but the point is I'm not, I'm not bootstrapping the founders' beliefs uh, here into some, some sort of legitimacy. Now, if your view is that today the Constitution is still inadequate for whatever reason, because it's too undemocratic, because the Electoral College is undemocratic, equal representation in the Senate is undemocratic, or perhaps because it's insufficiently liberty protecting, because it doesn't clear, well, I mean, I guess it depends on your interpretation, but if it doesn't clearly uh, allow for, you know, public education as a constitutional mandate or, you know, government provided health care or same sex marriage or abortion or what have you, then maybe it's insufficiently rights protecting. Uh, some people claim it's a bit of both, which is weird, uh, you know, that, that you want it to be more democratic, but also less, right? So, so there's a balance, there's a balance. And that's just something that has to be argued on the merits of, of the constitution we have. And certainly if you look uh, across history and across the world today, I think you'll be hard pressed to find a constitution that uh, is as good at striking this balance that I've described, but you might disagree with that, or you might disagree that, that th that's the objective, right? You might think the constitution needs to aim at 
economic efficiency and wealth redistribution, and it doesn't do that well, even though it does the democratic governance and the liberty uh, uh, well. So that's a normative argument, and I've tried to present the normative case, uh, but we can have an entire seminar, an entire four years of college and, 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 and graduate school to discuss these questions. Um, so if you disagree with me on the normative merits, you know, that, that, then that's a reason to convince others not to be bound by the Constitution. But I happen to think it, it is legitimate Constitution. That was a great answer. I, and I know I want to get to more questions. So I just want to say this is another place where we need to employ the method of pairwise comparison. So it's not just what are the flaws of the Constitution, because every single constitutional theory you can imagine has problems with race. So the question is not, does originalism have problems with race? It does. The question is, which theory does a better job, all things considered? And that's, that's just a different question. Pure theorian approach is going to have big race problems. Common law constitutionalism historically has had big race problems. So we need to make the comparison theory to theory, not just say, is originalism pure? It's not. Okay, I think the next question Professor Solom touched on earlier, so you might be able to just answer it quite quickly. Uh, Devin Chanel says, Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution indicates that the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. He shall hold his office during the term of four years, dot, dot, dot. Under an originalist reading, does this mean that only a man can be the president given the use of the masculine pronoun? No. Yeah, that question was probably put in before uh, that part of the presentation. Yeah, I think so. And, and by the way, though, you know, it's, it's, it goes to show you also, Justice Gorsuch, in his confirmation hearing, was asked this. He was asked this question, and I don't think he had a great answer to it, you know? He just kind of scoffed and said, oh, of course not. Of course, I'm not going to tell my daughter if she can't be president. But there was a much more sophisticated and appropriate answer to it, and, and Professor Solom has given it to us today. Great. Christopher Green asks the next question. He says, I wonder if the, bi the bindingness of the Constitution should depend on counterfactuals that assess where we would be if we had stuck with the Articles of the Confederation instead, even if we don't really owe anything to the founders, because actually the Articles, for some reason, would have been great if given a few more years. It seems to me that the Constitution could still be morally binding today because of our oaths today if the Constitution isn't so bad to justify lying or oath breaking. So that's two questions. And by the way, that sounds like the Christopher Green. <laughs> One question. This, I, welcome to the programming. Of Confederation. I, what I, I want to say is um, just putting the hypos to the side. We were, we were on the verge of being a failed state in 1787. So in the real world, you know, the comparison of the Constitution to the Articles, it, it, it couldn't be clearer. Uh, the Articles just were leading to a situation where the Union was about to unwind would have been very likely that parts of the United States would have been recolonized by European powers. Um, uh, Constitution looks really good in comparison to where the Articles would have gone. Oaths is a different question. Um, people can disagree about this. You do s swear an oath as an official to this Constitution, and I think this Constitution as the academic Christopher Green and perhaps the Christopher Green who act with, asked the question, I don't know, um, uh, has, has argued very persuasively means the written constitution, not David Strauss's common law constitution or Ronald Dworkin's moral reading constitution. Um, whether the oath will bear the weight of the moral argument, the argument of political morality for originalism, I have my doubts about that, but this is something we could disagree about. By the way, if I can just jump in on that first uh, part of that question, I do think it's important to judge actors, people, the Constitution itself, in the context of its 
time. Of course, if we had the same constitution today as they had in 1787 or 1789 or 1789 or 1791, maybe it would be worth abandoning. You know, I, I think we need the Equal Protection Clause. I think we need the Privileges and Immunities Clause. I think we need the 14th Amendment at a minimum. And, and the 15th and the 19th right to, to make the Constitution legitimate in the sense I'm describing it today. But when we're attacking the founders for their work, when we say the Constitution was pro slavery, you really have to ask that question and explore that question in context right. People say, oh, the Atlantic slave trade clause, it presumed that there would be a slave trade but but wait a minute, the Atlantic slave trade clause empowered Congress. There was no power under the Articles of Confederation to prohibit the international slave trade. The Atlantic Slave Trade em uh, Clause empowered Congress in 20 years to actually abolish it. And it did. And all states but one actually had abolished it before. Uh, the Territories Clause. This gave Congress power to abolish slavery in the territories, which it did. Uh, quite actively. This was an improvement over the Articles of Confederation. It's true Congress didn't have power over slavery in the states, but in one respect, this protected slavery, uh, excuse me, this protected the achievement of the abolitionists too. I mean, the Southerners, due to a slightly more complicated problem with the three-fifths clause, had a representation bump, had a political power bump. If they had gotten into power, and a lot of them did, uh, lots of Virginians were president for the first several decades, right? I mean, they could have wiped out the gains of the abolitionists in the states, and it looked like they were on the verge of doing it in 1860 uh, with the follow on to the Dred Scott, Scott case. The three fifths compromise is, admitted, is admittedly complicated. Um, it's not bad for the reason people think it's bad. It's bad because it gave the South a bump in representation, right? For, for every person you've enslaved who gets no vote, no say in the political process, you gain three-fifths for purposes of representation. So it would have been even worse if they had been five-fifths for purposes of representation, right? The whole idea was to have zero-fifths for purposes of representation if they can't vote, if they're enslaved, right? Um, but it was still nevertheless a, a, a bump, ultimately. One that didn't matter very much after the first decade or two uh, because the population of the North outstripped. And then I'll say one last thing, the Fugitive Slave Clause. Uh, that is the most odious of all the all the clauses. There's no question about that. But just ask yourself, would the cons would the South have agreed to the Constitution without it? And if they hadn't, would slavery not exist? Would slavery have been extirpated then and there? No, there would have just been a Southern Confederacy in 1789, uh, over which the North had no control short of an international war, which it's unclear what the authority for that would have been and so on. So, so all that's a long way of, of, of talking about what I kind of wanted to talk about in response to that question, uh, which is, you know, uh, you have to judge the Constitution in the context of, of the time and what it was an improvement upon. Great. Nico Beltramo asks the next question. He says, we might think of original public meaning being expressed in two different ways. Subjective original public meaning, what people actually understood the text to mean at the time, and the objective original public meaning, what people should have understood it to mean based on the linguistic rules and dictionary definitions, etc. Terry Lee Grove has written on the distinction recently. How should we understand this distinction and which of the two should we be trying to follow or should we be following something else? This is especially interesting in light of the boss like opinions and Jack Balkan's comments uh, that we are interested in original public meaning instead of original anticipated applications. So, uh I don't buy this distinction, um, at least not the way it's that Niccolo's very, you know, very probing question articulated it. Um, original public meaning is not um, objective in the sense that it is the result of hypothetical reasonable actors. Um, it's a meaning that no one need have grasped at the time, right? That's not my original public meaning originalism, and it shouldn't be anyone's original public meaning originalism. So uh, inquiry into the original public meaning of the constitutional text is an inquiry into the meaning communicated to the public by the words at the time. But now, what does that mean? You need to get finer grain than that. Um, of course, not everyone read the Constitution. Most people didn't. Um, and some people 
undoubtedly had mistaken beliefs about what the Constitution meant, just like I have mistaken beliefs about what particular words mean. Now, it's getting rare. I'm old. So my, when I run into a word and I discover that I don't know what it means, that's getting pretty rare. I remember my first year of teaching, I um, misunderstood the meaning of the word um, averse, uh, as in risk aversion. Right? So I just got a text wrong. But the reason I got it wrong is not because some idealized platonic reader would have gotten it right. It's because linguistic facts on the ground, the linguistic community, establishes a truth of the matter about aversion. And it doesn't mean the same thing as adversion, which is what I mistakenly thought in the early 1980s. Original Bostock and original anticipated applications. This is just so great. Thank you, Nicola. This is such a great question. So Gorsuch's position in Bostock, you can we can argue about whether he's right or wrong. Kavanaugh has some good arguments, right? But as Gorsuch understands the statutory text. He's saying that this is the meaning that the text had. You, the discrimination on the basis of sex at the time extended to these things people didn't think it extended to. Now, you need to give an explanation now. You need what philosophers call an error theory. You need an explanation as to how they made that mistake. Right? Well, let me give another example a constitutional example, the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment. It guarantees privileges or immunities. Let's just assume with the majority of academic writers, that means basic rights, including the right to practice a lawful profession and to own property and to enter into contracts, but practice a lawful profession. And it extends to all citizens. Myra Bradwell of Bradwell versus Illinois says, I'm a citizen. Being a lawyer is a lawful profession. What profession is more lawful than being a lawyer? And therefore, since I passed the bar exam, that's a reasonable restriction. Since I passed the bar exam of Illinois, I'm entitled to be a lawyer. It's one of the privileges or immunities the 14th Amendment guarantees to me. Now, some of the majority in Bradwell said privileges or immunities, they hardly exist. Right? The list of privileges or immunities those people recognized is absurd. Come, they were listed in the slaughterhouse cases. When you study that case, you will hardly believe how narrow the set was. They limited it to things like you have a, the following privilege or immunity. If the United States Navy is protecting you on the high seas against pirates, the state of Louisiana cannot send the Louisiana Navy to help the pirates. Well, the other dissenters who had dissented in the slaughterhouse had to say something else because they thought that a law the right to practice a lawful protection was a privilege or, or immunity of national citizenship. And so they argued, women aren't qualified to be lawyers. They lack the intellectual capacity to be lawyers, right? That's not part of the meaning of the 14th Amendment. That's a factual belief. We are not bound by the factual beliefs of the framers. We're not bound by the factual beliefs of judges who interpret a constitutional provision. If you're an originalist, you're bound by the text and by the real facts. The real facts. And of course, under the real facts, Myra Bradwell should have won, as Chief Justice Salmon P. Chase recognized. Great. The next question is from John Gakus. He says, 
Has social contract theory been studied to explain how our constitution works? This theory was espoused prior to the constitution by philosophers such as Locke and Hobbes and was known to have inspired the founders. Uh, I'll take a, I'll take a step at that one. Uh, the short the short answer is it's a, it's a part of the equation. You'll notice that again, kind of like in my response uh, to the question about race, I actually left social contract theory to kind of an afterthought. I think in 1789 they were thinking deeply about this. This is when they said they needed this act of popular sovereignty, popular ratification, the approbation of the people because they believed they were effectively in a state of nature in 1776. After the Articles of Confederation, it was, it was hairier, right? But they certainly believed that they were originating a social contract, whether it was the state constitutions at the time, the Articles of Confederation or, or the, the federal constitution. But it gets trickier uh, to say, well, are we still part of that social contract several generations later? That's the Jefferson, you know, if I did this whole 25 minute song and dance, I start with the, the exchange of letters between Jefferson and Madison, where Jefferson said the earth belongs to the living, not to the dead. The dead have either power nor rights over it. One generation, he said, is to another, is one independent nation to another. Every 19 years, he thought there should be a constitutional convention. And Madison's response was the improvements made by the dead form a debt against the living. Madison thought this social contract, because it was this improvement, projects into the future. It binds future generations. This is more of a Burkean actually kind of argument. And Jefferson, in a way, is a more purely contractarian, uh, you know, that every generation in you has to enter into the social contract. And I'm a Madisonian in this regard. I mean, they agreed on a lot, Jefferson and Madison, and it's remarkable that they disagreed about this. Uh, I'm more of a Madisonian. I believe the social contract is necessary to launch civil society, to launch sort of a constitutional project. But then again, after that, we're born into that project, we're born into that society, and something else must keep it going. Or as sort of the Burkean response to Locke kind of quippingly is, where were Locke's parents? Locke wasn't born in the state of nature. He was born in a political and economic and social and cultural community. And, and I find that quite persuasive, uh, but it was clearly influential on the founders and it was a key ingredient in setting the constitution in motion. I don't mean to say it's unimportant today, but I think, uh, but it's not quite the argument I make in the book. And, and I mean, you heard actually hear what Professor Solon has to say about this. Yeah, assuming you have something to say, I don't know. No, what Elon said. What I like to hear. All right, Matthew Kincaid asks the next question. He says, interested in how the panelists view respect for precedent in our system interacting with faithfulness to originalism. Scalia seems to consider precedent as an occasional exception to originalism, but are there more drawbacks with his approach as compared with a strict following of, of originalism? Yeah, I'm thinking a lot about this question. I'm sure Elon is too. Um, so first thing I wanna say is we need to distinguish between vertical and horizontal stare decisis. I believe that vertical stare decisis is consistent with originalism in part because of the Supreme Court Clause. Supreme in the Supreme Court Clause does not refer to the name of the court as it does now. It refers to the function of the court. Uh, which is supremacy. And so I think vertical stare decisis is consistent with originalism, um, subject to some qualifications, which are irrelevant for this purpose. So horizontal stare decisis in the Supreme Court. I think that originalists should be worried about horizontal stare decisis in the Supreme Court. Um, and my view as a matter of ideal theory is, that um, it is permissible to give horizontal stare decisis effect to precedents that are making a good faith effort to determine original meaning, even if you as a judge say, well, this is a very close question, I kind of lean the other way, right? And I would impose something like a, you know, clear and convincing evidence standard here, right? We would only overrule an originalist precedent if we were pretty sure that we're right and it's not going to change. 
change, right? We, we wouldn't want the meaning of the Constitution to flip-flop in response to this scholarly article, to this one, this one, this one. Uh, but that's ideal theory. What about the real world? I think that's even more difficult. In the real world, there are two clearly originalist judges on the Supreme Court, maybe a third. And I would say that then there are, that means that there are six non-originalists. It's a collegial court. So even originalists need to take precedent into account because they, you just, it's just not workable to function on the Supreme Court for, for all the originalists to function as non-cooperators in the ongoing business of the court. And so, yeah, there's a difference here between how Gorsuch and Thomas play that. Gorsuch, not blind follower of precedent, but he is cooperating on many issues with a non-originalist majority of the court. Thomas tends to go his own way, but I think that it's understandable that we get Gorsuch's and Scalia's who did the same thing. Uh, it's even more important that originalists be willing to play some ball on the lower federal courts. The circuit, originalists, if originalists on circuit court panels just said, I'm not joining any non-originalist opinion ever, that would be a big problem for their colleagues, for the way the courts function. So there's the non-ideal real world where precedent and originalism have a more complicated um, uh, interaction until we get an originalist majority on the Supreme Court. Then watch out. I don't have much to add to that, except I'll say I'll give a plug. Law and Liberty uh, posted an essay by a law professor at St. John's today, a pretty long essay on originalism and stare decisis. And three, uh, and, and myself and two other law, law professors are responding to that essay. And so uh, I would uh, I just commend that to you um, if you want to read more about it. Going off of what Professor Solon just said, I'm going to ask the next question. Uh, Lewis Davis asks, how would you classify each of the current Supreme Court justices within the subtypes of living constitutionalism and originalist camps that uh, Professor Solon laid out? Well, they're my category, so I guess I, I, I ought to give a shot at this. Um, so I would classify Thomas as uh, Thomas and Gorsuch is originalist with slightly different attitudes towards precedent. Um, I think Kavanaugh is unclassifiable at the moment. He's clearly open to originalist arguments, but he is also open to arguments from precedent that are inconsistent with originalism. I think that um, the rest of the court um, does not fit neatly in any of the academic boxes of constitutional theory. I think that um, all of the rest, and um, to some extent Thomas and Gorsuch as well, were trained in an academic environment where um, the Harvard Legal Process School had an enormous influence, even Although, even though some of the people who were saying Harvard legal process things didn't know anymore how influenced they were by the, the legal process school. So um, Harvard legal process theory is a, a, a version of living constitutionalism, but it has this very peculiar category, a character. The legal process uh, approach tries to erase evidence of its own existence. It tries to pretend that all we're doing is just lawyerly arguments based on precedents, and then they have this catchphrase that's super important. And the reasoned elaboration of the law, and it's that point where they start doing reasoned elaboration that the values of the judges end up deciding the cases. And not all of the precedents that constitute 99% of the opinion. Well, most Supreme Court justices do it in basically that way, with Gorsuch, 
Thomas, and a couple of others occasionally as exceptions. Great, Chris Baldacci asks the next question. He says, when should an originalist be willing to declare that a provision is open textured or under, under determined? Does it function like the threshold determination of ambiguity as in Chevron deference? Or is it simply a recognition that there are multiple reasonable interpretations of what the original meaning was? If it is the latter, what is your preferred method of choosing between multiple reasonable interpretations of the original public meaning and why? I'll take a stab at this one. And so first I'm gonna fight the premise and then I'll answer the question or what's left of it. I am not convinced that the constitution is this woefully indeterminate or underdeterminate document. I think most of the clauses that are often pointed to as evidence of, oh, we could be both living constitutionalists and originalists because equal protection, that's so broad, or due process just means fairness and, that, and that's so broad, or the necessary and proper clause, what does that mean? Or the Ninth Amendment, what does that mean? With a little hard work and application, I think we'll discover that these actually are quite determinate phrases with quite specific meanings that can and do apply to new and changing circumstances, but just to sort of go down the list. Everyone calls the necessary and proper clause the elastic clause and the sweeping clause, and, and so it is, but does it give Congress all of these new powers since the New Deal or, or earlier? And the answer is, well, the necessary and proper clause, there was a rich legal history of necessary and proper clauses, and they were understood to be grants of implied powers only, not great substantive and independent powers. Now we can debate what's a great substantive independent power. Would abrogating sovereign immunity be such a power? Uh, and if so, it has to be explicitly enumerated. It can't be left to implication in the necessary and proper clause. There's still interpretation to do. There's still apl law application to be done. But the meaning is actually clear. Lesser powers connected to the enumerated powers, yes. Great substantive independent powers, no. The due process clause, Michael McConnell has elaborated. And I, in my next book, I'll give it a plug now, the second founding and introduction to the 14th Amendment. I argue that all three provisions of section one of the 14th Amendment, the operative provisions, uh, had very specific antebellum legal meanings. Due process of law did not mean whatever's fair. It meant there had to be established law, first and foremost, before you were deprived of life, liberty, or property. And your violation of that established law had to be adjudicated according to a certain number of procedures. Protection of the laws was the flip side. It was the legal protection the government gave your rights, you uh, and your rights against private interference. So due process of law, only the government can take away your life, liberty, or property, only pursuant to established law and pursuant to a certain process. Protection of the laws was the flip side. Judicial remedies, if someone interfered, trespassed, committed a battery, judicial remedies, police services, and so on, and the privileges or immunities clause. I admit this is the most ambiguous, but it was mentioned earlier, privileges or immunities, I think the best reading of the evidence is that they were re referred to civil rights as opposed to political rights. The question is, what does abridgment mean? And I think it was a non-discrimination provision. Some people disagree with me uh, and say it's a fundamental rights provision, fine, right? But the point is like we've narrowed the range of disagreements. I think commerce, is more narrow uh, than, than people, you know, today, if you read the cases, it's, oh, it's, if it's economic, right? If it has a, then it's commerce. Well, well, no, there's lots of economic activities that weren't commerce, production, mining, manufacturers, agriculture, things preceded commerce. Commerce was trade, exchange, and so on. So I just don't think the constitution is that narrow in really any of its provisions. That doesn't mean there won't be some underdeterminacies, right? Where, where it won't be underdeterminate in some cases, you know, and then I think I commend to you Will Bode's article on liquidation that within the range of plausible meanings, over time, various constitutional actors can um, settle on one of the answers within that range. So sorry that was a long-winded answer, but again, I just used your question as an opportunity to say what I wanted to say, so. Okay, I believe we have time for one more question, depending on how long it goes. There's a number that we're not getting to, but thank you guys all so much for submitting those. They're great questions. Sorry for filibustering. It's <laughs> how I operate in class two. All right, Kendall Burchard asks, what support is there that the framers were using the public meaning of words when writing the various provisions of the Constitution? It seems attorneys slash legislatures, legislators often use the words with specific meanings, implications, which may or may not follow the general public interpretation of the today. Is 
it your contention or the original's position more broadly that words in the Constitution, if written at the same time, have the same meaning. I know consistent usage is often a presumption in the statutory context, but for example, are treaties in Article 1 and Article 2 thought to be the same thing? Okay, there was a lot uh, in that question, uh, and I'm, I hope I address most of it or all of it. The first thing I'll say is, I mean, there's, there's actually an interesting debate uh, going on among originalists. I'm not sure it's I'm not sure much is at stake in this debate, but some people say, well, the Constitution is written in its legal meaning, has legal terms of art. And I think, of course, that's true. Of course, some terms are legal terms of art. What's an ex post facto clause? If you want, what's bankruptcy versus insolvency? Does Congress have the power over insolvency? This was debated in Congress in 1842. So sometimes these diverge, but for the most part, the public, the ratifying public understood that legal terms of art would be given their legal meaning. So, so that was sort of understood. I don't, I don't see a big difference between sort of original meaning and, and, and technical legal meaning, but, but certainly there's both. Uh, and I, yeah, I think the presumption is that they use the similar words or the same word in, in different parts consistently. I do think that's true. I'd be curious, you know, for an example of, of where they might be different or lead to it and, and where a case, you know, hinges on, on that. I can't think of one at the moment, but, but I think that's certainly plausible. I don't know if, if, if Larry, if I've missed anything that you wanted to mention in that, but, but the this is a great question, and um, I, I think most originalists agree with uh, Professor Akhil Amar of Yale uh, and his method of intratextualism. That is, when, word, when the same word is used um, uh, in uh, different places in the Constitution, we start with a presumption. It's defeasible. It can be overridden by evidence that the meaning is probably the same. Um, but let me, let's talk about the ex post facto clause because this is, this is really interesting, right? So um, I, I think Elon's just wrong about the ex post facto clause. Um, there's a lot of linguistic evidence about uh, the phrase uh, ex post facto and how it was used in 1787. And that evidence clearly establishes that the phrase ex post facto had an ordinary meaning, uh, that regular people used that phrase all the time. It was not limited to lawyers. And this came up in the Virginia Ratifying Convention. There was a debate about the meaning of the ex post facto clause. And uh, here's one side of the debate. Ex post facto. It's the technical meaning that counts, and it only applies in criminal cases. So Governor Randolph gets up and says, uh, you're just wrong. Ex post facto has an ordinary meaning, and this is a constitution written for the people. And so we give the phrase ex post facto its ordinary meaning. Its ordinary meaning applies to both civil and criminal cases. Uh, and others joined Randolph, and you know you can't tell because no vote was taken. But I think it's a fair reading of the Virginia Ratifying Convention to say that the um, uh, ordinary understanding of uh, the ex post facto clause uh, prevailed. Not in court later. Not in court later. Later on, the narrower technical meaning prevailed. But I think originalists should reject that conclusion. I think the S post facto clause's original meaning applies to civil cases. And I think the record establishes that, although it's something we certainly can argue about. It's not one of those cases where the evidence is perfectly clear all on one side. There are many issues in constitutional law Elon mentioned the Privileges or Immunities Clause, where there's more than one position supported by evidence. And in that case, I think the obligation of originalist judges is to go with the better evidence, with what they believe the better evidence to be. And I do think that once cases are decided, or if it's a close case and there are multiple positions, we ought to hop, skip, and jump between different interpretations lightly. 
we ought to move to a new interpretation only if the evidence is compelled. Well, great. I think that concludes our time. I'm so sorry to the people whose questions we didn't get to. There are so many good ones, though, so thank you for those. Um, Professor Soul and Professor Warman, thank you so much for joining us this evening. For our audience members, our next event is next Tuesday, the 8th, for our uh, Supreme Court Roundup event with Professors Julia Mahoney, Daniel Ortiz, and uh, Jeff Harris. Once again, thank you guys so much, and I hope everyone has a good rest of their evening. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.